many travelers never suspect that their home away from home is a haunted hotel. But lavish lobbies and inviting bedrooms can be home to legendary terrors. And now and then, an innkeeper's story will reveal a history alive with horror. There are stories that terrify. It was the most frightening time of my life. And stories that chill. It gets kind of creepy when you remember what happened there. We will travel a world where memories haunt and phantoms lurk. And the impossible lies just around the corner. The adventure of travel takes on an extra thrill when there is a chance your hotel is home to a spirit from beyond. In fact, many travelers seek out hotels with tales of hauntings. But not everyone wants to actually see a ghost. They'll come in and say, well, I want to stay in a haunted hotel, but I don't want to stay in a haunted bedroom, you know. I want to be next door, so if anything goes on, I'll hear the people who are in the haunted room run out. But what is a guest to do when all the rooms are said to be haunted? Ghosts seem to be accepted by the English as a natural part of the landscape. With its rich history and turbulent past, many believe the spirits of those who died on English soil remain there today. It's sort of almost part of the, the, the psyche, the English psyche. So this idea of um, spirits being associated with the land is very, very old uh, and, and very much part of British culture. Pubs are also an essential part of English culture and the way of life. It is Kirkstone Pass Inn, one of the oldest pubs in the world, that is said to be one of England's most haunted. place is full of spirits. But one of the, the spookiest ones is a, a slithery, cold thing. Kirkstone Pass Inn sits 1,500 feet above sea level in the Cumbria region of northern England, making it one of the highest buildings in the country. It was originally a coaching inn. The foundations date back to about 2,000 years. So you're talking a building that you know, predates the birth of Jesus Christ. And the pub was actually built, was serving beer in 1496, when Henry VIII, I think, was 13. So quite a lot of beers have gone out this place. <laughs> the inn's nearest neighbour is seven miles down a treacherous mountain pass. It's like being in God's back garden, you know. But when the mist rolls down, it's like you're in the middle of the clouds, you know and it swirls, and it swirls around the windows. And if you could imagine sort of what Jack the Ripper's fog was like, it's just like that. You can't see at all. It looks like someone's holding a white blanket in front of the window pane. Many have lost their way, never to be seen again, when the weather in the tranquil pass suddenly gives way to unexpected storms. One of the victims of the mountain pass was a young mother named Ruth Ray. The story of Ruth Ray dates from the early 1800s, and in those days, you know, poor people didn't have any other transport apart from their feet. Ruth was at home tending her newborn son when she received the news that her father was on his deathbed. This part of England is very mountainous, and um, if, you, if you wanted to go somewhere, you had to walk. Ruth set out over the pass to see her father. She had to take a baby with her. So she walked up Kirkstone Pass in snow, and nothing was heard from her. You're literally on the edge up here. And if you were to walk out and the pub was closed, 
and the mist came down, you would never find your way back. You, you would walk off the edge. You just wouldn't find your way. You can't see it. It's, it's so dangerous up here. You can imagine um, the emotions of a woman walking, knowing probably she's going to die, and also knowing that her child may die. There's no hope. The despair must have been incredible. Ruth's frozen, lifeless body was later found near Kirkston Pass Inn, just a few feet away from the warmth and shelter that could have saved her. In Ruth's arms lay her infant son. By a miracle, she'd wrapped the child in a shawl and the, the child somehow had been kept warm and sheltered by its mother's body and the baby son was alive. Some say Ruth's love for her child is what keeps her spirit at Kirkston Pass Inn. The reports of seeing a woman cradling a baby, seeing a woman looking for something, hearing a baby crying. Ruth's wintry spirit is said to be shrouded in despair, doomed to search forever for the child she was never able to raise. The very stones of the old inn seem to be etched with misery of the wretched souls who left this life too soon. Kirkston Pass Inn in Cumbria, said to be one of the most haunted inns in England, is also thought to be home to the spirit of a small child. Neville was a young lad, you know, he was probably maybe 10, 11 years of age. Kirkston Pass Inn was one of the first coaching inns along the busy trade route to Scotland, and long ago, Nettle was the son of the inn's carriage master. Wagons used to come up, change the teams of horses, people maybe come in and have a beer or stay the night. Nettle eagerly awaited each new traveller who came up the pass, until one day, his excitement led to disaster. He heard carriage coming. He walked into the road and he didn't stop. They ran him down, he died, they killed him and the coach didn't stop at all, it just went straight on to Scotland. He's one of, our, one of our people that stay with us now. At Kirkston Pass Inn, it is believed that Nettle's impish spirit is the force behind many baffling pranks. One evening in particular, I'd done the cashing out, put the burglar alarms on, locked all the doors, went to my home. When I came in in the morning, all the chairs, were all stacked on top of the tables. All the paintings we have on the wall were all taken down and were laid on the seats. Couldn't believe it, you know. And that's the sort of little tricks that he gets up to. Hotel staff say they've grown accustomed to Nettle's mischief. Lights come on when they should be off and doors are locked and they should be open. You definitely get the feeling you're sharing it with, with you know, another entity, I suppose. It's a kid who's having fun. It's as if you could hear him laughing at you, you know. It's like your naughty grandkid or, or your naughty son, but not malicious. Locals believe that lurking within the walls of Kirkston are much darker spirits, ghosts whose identities are not known and whose intentions are a mystery. One ghost is said to be the most evil of all its spectres, the mere mention of whose existence is strictly forbidden within the pub. One evening, my maintenance manager and myself were cashing up when we heard somebody walk across the ceiling. We had a dog with us at the time, so we went up the stairs, opened the door to the corridor, and tried to make the dog go first, being brave. <laughs> she wouldn't go. She sat down and totally refused to go. So you can imagine two big guys, right? One saying, you go first, no, you go first, you know. Somehow they knew these noises were neither the pranks of a young boy nor the cries of a desperate mother, but something far more terrifying. We burst into the first room, opened the door, flashlights everywhere, nothing. So we went to the second room, hearts bumping, you know, nothing. So now we know that whatever is in the last room, because there's no other way out of the pub, this is the final room. We took a big, deep breath and burst into the room. I saw something black flash across the side of the wall, and it kind of like dissolved through the wall. 
It was something evil. It made you scared. It was the most frightening time of my life. Staff of the Kirkston Pass Inn say the many spirits, both good and evil, will always make their presence known. At times we've looked out and you, you see people along the road. You go outside the door and there's nobody there. They want to know about you and, and you want to know about them. Sometimes things happen and we just accept it. But personal experiences have left some locals with a healthy respect for the existence of the supernatural visitors. The local taxi drivers won't come in the pub. If you order a taxi, they'll, they'll wait outside. They will not come in. I mean, one of the guys is about six feet two, and he weighs over 200 pounds. He's a massive man, you know? And one day he had an experience, and he will never set foot in the pub again. The taxi driver would never tell anyone what had happened but the event left its mark. He wouldn't set foot in the pub if you, you know, if you offered him a hundred quid, you know, he wouldn't come in. Just behind Kirkston Pass Inn grows an ancient hanging tree where countless criminals once gasped their lives out. It is said that silent souls still roam the site of their untimely deaths. We have a tree in the back garden where people used to be hung and uh, because you weren't allowed to be buried in consecrated ground. They just used to throw them over the fells, you know? <laughs> so they could, you could be walking along maybe one day and find a skull or something. The inn was also the site of a battle where the English ambushed a band of marauding Scots. And they killed every single one of them. It was a complete massacre. I think there, there are a lot of unhappy things that have happened around here. And I think sometimes, maybe, every now and again, they, they come back. Each year, tourists flock to vacation spots all over the world. They can choose a four-star hotel, historic castle, or a homely bed and breakfast. But what they can't always choose is who or what ghostly being might join them on their stay. The living are drawn to Louisiana's Cajun country for exceptional music, food, and good times. The region is so full of experience that even its ghosts seem more lively. It is there in Lafayette that a bed and breakfast known as T. Frères is said to harbor a spirit whose passion for life has never dimmed. Amelie has been seen, heard in all the rooms in the old part of the house. It's just, you name the room and I'll tell you the story. Even the attic. Even the attic. At first, the owners of the 1880s farmhouse were not aware that their new bed and breakfast had a supernatural reputation. We were moved in within two weeks after we saw the house. And we were so excited to be in this house that it just never occurred to us that it was haunted. It was all too easy to laugh off the warnings that the house was home to a Cajun French ghost named Amelie. I said, the ghost? In this house? I said, I don't think so. I've been here two weeks. I haven't seen a ghost. <laughs> That's how much I knew about ghosts. Amelie picked a day when no one was home to make her presence known. A young man had come to the T. Frere house. He knocked on the door and no one answered. And when he looked up, there was a woman standing in the window. And when she saw him, she stepped back and closed the curtain. The face in the window had matched the description of someone who lived at T. Frere's long ago. More than a century earlier, the house was home to a young widow who came there for her ritual period of mourning. The customs of the day required her to wear black and remain isolated from the world for a year. Her name was Amelie Kumo. After her young husband died, she came here to T. Ferrer's house to, for her year of mourning, which was very traditional a hundred years ago. In those days, all widows had strict codes of conduct. The only place she went was upstairs on the balcony to, for fresh air and sunshine because they didn't circulate in, in public for a year after you know, a death like that. It's called a widow's walk, a very appropriate family, I guess. 
Amelie had lost her husband, but not her Cajun spirit. And before long, she rebelled against her confinement. Amelie could be seen cavorting around, taking her bonnet off and letting her hair fly, which was a no-no in those days, a hundred years ago. Amelie was Cajun to the max. She was kind of eye, a wild little rebellious spirit, you could call it. Uh, she did things out of the ordinary. Amelie never remarried and lived alone at T. Frere's until, at the age of 32, she was stricken with fever. The ghost of Amelie is still here because of the tragic uh, circumstances of her death. All alone, with no one to call a doctor, Amelie's fever grew dangerous. And finally, half delirious, she went in search of water. It was a deadly decision. She walked from the house through the garden to the well. She had a fever, and it was at night. And no one knows whether she jumped or fell, but she drowned in the well in the backyard. I'd like to believe she fell. Yeah, yeah. The dawn found T. Frere's house dark and silent. It was a tragic death. The church ruled it a suicide and didn't bury her in hollow ground. It is uh, uh, a bad thing, you know. It means your body's not blessed. Can it be that Amelie's wild spirit refuses to accept the judgment passed on her? And not to be buried in hollow ground is, is very upsetting. Therefore, she's a restless spirit. I think that Amelie was determined to, to make us believers because shortly after we moved in, things began to happen. She threw bread around the kitchen, and when things go flying in, in the house and you don't see anyone doing the throwing, you know, it's certainly suspect of a spirit. Amelie is quick to make it known when she is displeased, and the thing that displeases her the most is change. Anytime you change things in the house, Amelie doesn't like it. One day, the former owner of T. Frere's decided to reorganize the kitchen, but as soon as she left the room, she heard a noise that chilled her to the bone. She heard this crash, bang, bang stuff falling. And she ran back, and all of her ketchup and minas and pickles and blah, blah, blah was on the floor, broken. Although prone to mischief, one day, Amelie revealed a streak of compassion toward T. Frere's former owner. She was upstairs in her bedroom, very ill with the flu. And she says someone covered her with a blanket, and now we have to believe it was Amelie. She was sick herself that way and probably could identify with fever and illness. Don't you think? Good ghost. Good ghost. But when new owners took over the bed and breakfast and began to rearrange the kitchen, once again, T. Frere's became a battleground. Evidently, she didn't like the way I had changed the decorations in the kitchen. About two days later, we hear this god-awful noise like someone was back there doing swish, bang, 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 bang. swish, bang, 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 bang. Scared us to death. Finally, the noise stopped. We tiptoed back there like we were going to wake up somebody after all this noise. And we looked, and we looked, and we looked. Shad, there was nothing out of place. Not a thing. And I still don't understand that. Surprisingly, the guests at T. Frere's don't mind sharing their rooms with a ghost. My guests love her. When it's, it makes for good table conversation at breakfast. Everybody's got their little stories, you know. I had a doctor come and, and looking for her. During the night, someone kept pulling his toes, and he finally figured out it had to be her. Some of them, it takes only one night to make a believer out of them. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Can it be that Amelie longs to return to the world of the living? Amelie is typical, typical of the Cajun character. Kanai, 
mischievous, a lot of fun, making jokes, having a good time. You know, she's just typical, typical Cajun character to me. They say le bon temps roule. Let the good times roll. <laughs> The corridors of T. Frères will sometimes remain peaceful for weeks at a time, but Amelie never stays away for too long. Sometimes I think she's gone, and then something else happens. It's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Some of the strange occurrences at T. Frères seem to indicate that Amelie wants to lend a helping hand to those living in her home. My 16-year-old son was upstairs in his bedroom, and he had forgotten a math paper. He was lying in the bed, wondering how to go get that paper. And the paper that he needed floated from the ceiling. I sat down on that one. Can't figure that out either. One sad reminder of Amelie's death rests in the shadows of T. Frere's house, the remains of the old well. When we moved in to the house, the well had been filled in already, but it was beginning to sink again. So we filled it in again. It gets kind of creepy when that well sinks again and you, you remember what happened there. As long as T. Frere's stands, the owners believe that Amelie will continue to visit and remind everyone whose home it was first. Coming into T. Frere's house has really made me a believer. I thought I believed before, but honey, something's going on in that spiritual world that we have no control of, none at all. A knock at the door late at night might be room service, but if your hotel room is said to be haunted, think twice before letting anyone in. With its sunny streets lined with restaurants and shops, the gas lamp district of San Diego looks like the ideal place to spend a vacation. But this well-kept area has a sordid past. And some say the ghosts from that time still call the gas lamp district and the Horton Grand Hotel home. It was pretty much um, uncivilized Western type gunslinging area. Although the Horton Grand was constructed in 1988, each brick of the hotel holds over a century of history. Assembled almost entirely out of the remains of two demolished 19th century hotels, today's Horton Grand stands in the heart of San Diego's former red light district. The Horton Grand is pretty much right in the middle of the original gas lamp quarter. Wyatt Earp uh, owned property here and had gambling halls. In the early days, it was lined with saloons and bordellos. One of the area's most crooked characters is said to have taken up permanent residency at the Horton Grand, a century after his murder. Roger Whittaker was at the center of some sordid but prosperous business dealings in 19th century San Diego. Roger was a pimp and a gambler. He is a shady character. Roger's dubious ways eventually caught up with him. Obviously, Roger was not a real likable person when he was alive. Apparently, he ran afoul of some of his cronies. And they done him in. Today, Roger is said to haunt room 309 and lives much as he did over a hundred years ago. I've had people call down to the front desk and tell me that they had left their room and their change was on the fireplace and it had all been stacked up neatly like so many poker chips. However, not all of Roger's hauntings have to do with his favorite pastime. The armoire doors in 309 have been noticed to open. The bed shake. And sometimes all Roger seems to want is his privacy. On more than one occasion, the room when it is unoccupied has been known to be dead bolted from the inside. Now, that one we cannot explain. 
The staff at the Horton Grand Hotel know that their guests do believe in Roger. The evidence can be found right in his room. Every room in the hotel has a journal. And the people like the journals very much. They put in their comments, and they treat them like little diaries. Many of the journal entries speak of strange things that have happened in room 309, and alert future guests that even when the room seems empty, they might not have it all to themselves. In fact, Roger appears in just about every journal in the hotel. I don't know whether Roger is making visits to other rooms or whether people just like to think he's around. I think he's become a bit of a mascot. Those who know the Horton Grand best feel that Roger's mischief is no cause for alarm. I think his scoundrel days were when he was actually walking around. I think he's more of a trickster now. Uh, again, a lot of walking, the bed shaking, leaving decks of cards and change piled up. He's more of a prankster now, I think. And then locking the doors, uh, shaking the pictures. Uh, yeah, he's more of a prankster now, I think, than anything else. According to local law, Another ghost with a scandalous past has also made the Horton Grand home. Her name is Ida Bailey. In 1887, when Ida came to town, prostitution was just part of the landscape. It was tolerated, although illegal. Ida set out to make her fortune during San Diego's late 19th century boom. She was quite a businesswoman, an ambitious, fiery redhead. So she decided that she should be a madam. She decided she was going to have the best bordello in town, and she did. It was really the first classy bordello and brought a little bit of class to the district that was so wild. In 1912, the district was shut down and Ida closed up shop. But now it seems Ida has come out of retirement and treats some guests at the Horton Grand Hotel as prospective clients. She also likes to visit room 209 here in the hotel. And her little trick is she will knock on the door. And if a woman answers, nobody will be there. But if a man answers, Ida will be there, but will slowly fade away. So she's still looking around. Aside from the girls at the brothel, Ida never had much of a relationship with women. Apparently, Ida does want the men to see her. And uh, the women never wanted to see her when she was alive. And I guess she doesn't want them to see her while she's in their present form. Staff and guests at the Horton Grand feel that they share their hotel with spirits who just want to reclaim their scandalous past in the gas lamp district. It was a very dynamic, happening community. It probably represents a lot of good times for the spirits that were here and are here. When you spend a night in a haunted hotel, locking your door won't keep out the guests who don't need keys. The town of Calotte in the southwest of France is a jumble of medieval houses on crooked stone streets. Looming nearby is the 13th century Chateau de Puy-Martin, There, footsore travelers may sleep in ancient splendor and perhaps hear a ghost story from a member of the ghost's own family. This castle has belonged to my family since 1450. For five and a half centuries, the de Montbron family have been the owners of this chateau. In recent years, they have opened up their ancestral home to guests. 
The most ancient section is the North Tower. It's from the 1200s. The oldest part of Puymartin is also the setting for its strangest story. It all began with the de Montbron's ancestor, the lady of the chateau, Thérèse de Saint-Clair. The lady lived in the 17th century. She was very beautiful, and her husband was very, very jealous. Thérèse's husband, the Lord of Puymartin, was at the forefront of Catholic forces fighting the Protestants during France's religious wars. He fight against Protestants, but he was very often out of his castle. And she was alone in this cold castle. While her Catholic husband fought the Protestants, Therese waited, and before long, she found a companion in her loneliness. He was a Protestant knight. She met a young knight, a jeune chevalier, and uh, it's a love story. But their love was not meant to be. One day, her husband returned without warning and he found her in the arms of a lover. They came back, and he surprised his wife with the young knight. And it was terrible. And above all, the young knight was Protestant. He found in his castle a Protestant with his wife. Ah, terrible. In his fury, the husband killed the knight, then dragged his wife up the stone steps of the North Tower. He was a wicked, jealous man, and his wife had dishonored his name, the name of his ancestors. Mad with rage, he locked her up in a small room at the top of the North Tower. It was the last time Therese would ever cross the threshold. Slow months went by, but her husband never relented. And 15 years after she entered the room, she died, still a captive. Unforgiving till the last, Therese's husband buried her body in the tower wall to make certain she would remain in her prison for all eternity. But inexplicable events suggest that in death, if not in life, Therese has finally escaped her prison and haunts the chateau as the White Lady of Puymartin. The White Lady aren't still uh, the castle. My father met her and guessed too. Just beneath the White Lady's chamber lies a guest room. There, four years ago, a guest from Texas woke to an eerie sight. The Texan saw the White Lady in the, in the room, in the guest room. He saw just a face on a curtain. And he was very, very upset. When he told his hosts the story, they were not surprised. Most of the time, uh, the white lady appeared to the man. And it's funny because uh, the guest, uh, Texan, who saw the white lady was Protestant. And she liked Protestant, I think so. <laughs> and, and, and he was alone. That's the reason why uh, he was Protestant alone, uh, wonderful. <laughs> the Count remembers seeing his ancestor face to face. I saw the Dame Blanche. I saw the white lady twice. The first time it was a transparent form. A very beautiful lady on the staircase in front of the room she lived in for so long. And that lasted less than five seconds, but it seemed like a long time. The second time I saw her, it was by her room. 
Those who have seen the White Lady say that after each taste of freedom, she always returns to her room of suffering. Today, the Count wonders if he has seen his sad ancestor for the last time. She shows herself mostly to young men. Therefore, I may never have the chance to see her again. And one member of the de Montbrun family is still waiting to meet her. My father saw the white lady, but me, I, I never saw the white lady. I'm sad. I should want to meet the white lady and, and to speak perhaps with her, uh, to, to see her. Uh, it's my wish, really. Puy-Martin's greatest mystery remains entombed forever within the walls of the old North Tower. We don't know today if, if, if uh, our body is still there. We suppose, but we don't want to, to know. It's a mystery of the castle. But my father said, don't touch anything there, don't dig the wall. We want to keep the mystery. In haunted hotels, sometimes it's not the guests, but the ghosts who have made early departures. Along the bayous of Louisiana, soft breezes sway the Spanish moss. The setting seems too serene for the violence that once shattered the peace at the plantation home at Chrétien Point. Two hours west of New Orleans, Chrétien Point's 1831 plantation house is so evocative of the Old South that even Hollywood once looked to it for inspiration. There was a photographer and he came out here and he took pictures of Chrétien Point, the stairway particularly. The photographer had heard of the plantation's dark story, for the stairway was the point of a violent killing long ago there was going to be a killing on the stairway in the movie. So he took pictures of the arched windows in the stairway, and indeed, Hollywood copied the stairway from Cratian Point for Taras in the movie Gone with the Wind. This Louisiana version of Tara once was home to its very own Scarlet. Very much like in the movie Gone with the Wind, there was also a young woman, and she was very independent soul. Her name was Felicite Cratian. She was the first liberated woman of Louisiana. She rode her horse astride like a man, and she smoked cigars and she gambled. Felicite's husband had died young, leaving his wife to cope alone. And that meant Felicite had to take over running of the plantation, and she did quite well. She was quite a good businesswoman. But running the farm was far from the only business at Chrétien Point. For years, the plantation had been financed in part by dealings with pirates. They accumulated a lot of goods, and they would buy and sell here at what is now known as Chrétien Point. All of the stolen goods were sold here. She did what she had to do to survive. She kept up the contraband dealings, the black market dealings, and uh, that's how she got herself in with a little bit of the trouble that ended up happening over here. Late one night, Felicite heard her door opening and realized instantly that dealing with pirates was a dangerous game. She knew she was in trouble. She grabbed a handful of jewelry and a pistol, and she went and stood at the head of the stairs and waited. And sure enough, one of the pirates was on his way up the stairs. She just waited for that perfect moment. In the darkened staircase, Felicite needed to make her one bullet count. She shook her jewelry in front of her and said, don't come any further. And Felicite really was saying, come a little bit closer. I can't see you well enough yet. So as he came up the stairs, I'm close enough to her, she pulled a pistol out, shot him in the head and killed him. 
Aware that the other pirates might come in search of their comrade, Felicite dragged the body downstairs. They took his body and put it in the cabinet under the stairs for the rest of the night, and he finished bleeding under, under there. Now the flooring under the stairs is almost totally black. In the morning, the servants carried away the pirate's body, but some feel that his spirit remained behind. So that is one of our ghosts. We call him Robert, and uh, Robert we don't make fun of. Robert has been known to go to great lengths to make sure that people take him seriously. My first cousin came to dinner, and I was telling him about the ghosts, and he says, you're crazy to believe in things like that. Pounded on the table, he said, there's no such things in, as a ghost, and you know it. And the French doors of the dining room that were latched, and they opened up all by themselves. Just beyond the doors lies the closet that once served as the pirate's makeshift tomb. So from then on, we talk about Robert. We mention that he's there, and, but we don't make fun of him. But Chrétien Point's most active spirit seems to be Robert's old adversary, the lady of the house. The house is absolutely a no-smoking zone, but at times, you will smell cigar smoke in the house. When we smell that cigar light up, we know it's Miss Felicite. None of us smoke cigars. Then all of a sudden that just hits you out of nowhere, just the smell of cigar, strong. Of course, this was her house first, so we allowed her to smoke in the house. At times, the objects in Felicite's home appear to be moved by unseen hands. There was this rocking chair in the room from the 1800s, but nobody was sitting in the chair. And all of a sudden, that rocking chair started rocking. The next day, one of the docents was giving a tour, and she told the story of yesterday, the chair rocking. And her back was to the chair, and a gentleman on the tour said, well, look, it's rocking now. Nobody was in the chair, and there was the chair rocking. So she said, well, enough of that. Let's go out on the gallery. The doors to the gallery opened by themselves. Can this be the work of Felicite still guarding her home? Maybe she's out there looking for the pirates to come back again. Who knows? The owner of Chrétien Point still seems to live there to this day. Sometimes I see Felicite looking through the windows. Sometimes she's sitting down in her parlor. We've had uh, one of the tour guides walk in and she's sitting down in, in one of the wingback chairs. Miss Felicite wants you to know that this is her house. This is still her house. Felicite still has her own idea of where things belong. We have a card table that's upstairs, and I'll put the cards in a position, and I'll go back for a tour, and the cards are in a different place. Sometimes I try to make excuses. Maybe one of the maids came up here and moved the cards, or was cleaning, but... That's Miss Felicite. I think Miss Felicite loves her cords in a specific place, and nobody touches her cords. As when she was alive, Miss Felicite is fiercely protective of her property. They see Miss Felicite walking up and down on the galley, wandering, waiting, watching out maybe for anybody who's coming out to see her. Most of all, Felicite seems to want to remind today's guests that she is still the mistress of her home. She was a woman to be reckoned with. <laughs> the ghosts, the people that lived here before, they had a right to be here at one time. So as far as I'm concerned, they still have a right to be here. The owners of Cretien Point believe in their spirits. They also believe that one day they too may become permanent residents of the plantation. The energy sources from people who have been here before are certainly still in this house. And I would assume, since we've been here a long time, 
I've owned this house for about 26 years now. I would imagine 100 years from now, the energy that my wife and I and our children have left here will certainly show itself to other people that are here later on. So that's okay. Haunted hotels are filled with the poignant tales of souls that cannot seem to rest in peace. The entities that are stuck in the hotel, they like to let the people that are visiting know that they are present and they don't want you to mess with them. This is their territory. Perhaps it's a violent death that keeps them trapped. If there was an event that somebody became murdered or died in, in a room or a hotel, that spirit is trapped in that hotel. Or perhaps it's simply home.